My name is Kayla Blinko. I'm currently an assistant professor at the University of the Virgin Islands. Uh, the work that I am going to be talking about that's being published in Pure J was actually done uh, at my previous institution when I was a PhD student at Scripps Institution of Oceanography at the University of California, San Diego. So the research that we have getting published in Pure J centers on giant sea bass. Uh, their scientific name is Stereolepis gigas. They are a really culturally iconic and important species in the coastal waters of Southern California and Baja California, Mexico. So they're one of many uh, fish species that form seasonal spawning aggregations. So uh, a couple months out of the year, they all come together and they uh, in these big groups and they spawn. Um, and this makes them really susceptible to being caught by fishermen. If you can identify where their spawning aggregation is, you can go and catch a bunch of them all at once. Um, and so people kind of caught on to this and started catching them. Um, and what happened was, is we basically completely knocked down their populations in Southern California. So this is kind of a bummer, <laughs> uh, but there is a positive side to the story in that um, California Department of Fish and Wildlife implemented a number of different fisheries management um, strategies that kind of helped this species turn around. Uh, so some of those things were one regulation specifically on giant sea bass, but also the banning of nearshore gill nets in California. And so all of these kind of fisheries management strategies combined has led to their kind of starting to recover in Southern California. Um, and as an ecologist, as a researcher, this is really cool because we now have an opportunity to ask and answer questions about just like fundamental aspects of their ecology um, that we've never been able to ask before because their populations were just so depressed. So our goal with this study was to track giant sea bass to be able to answer questions about their fundamental movement ecology. So how big are their home ranges? Do they show seasonal differences in their movement patterns? Can we see them doing different movement behaviors during spawning season? Um, beyond kind of these just fundamental questions, we were also interested in seeing how giant sea bass were interacting with existing, sp existing spatial management measures as well as local recreational fishing activity. So we conducted this study in La Jolla. Um, it's actually where Scripps Institution of Oceanography is located, and it was the perfect place to do this study because in that region, uh, there are multiple marine protected areas, as well as one of the most highly trafficked recreational fishing grounds in San Diego. And the reason we were interested in this is that one of the things that we think might be influencing giant sea bass kind of in this contemporary age in the United States where um, people aren't really allowed to catch them is accidental or incidental catch of giant sea bass. Um, and so a part of this study, we were interested in seeing, you know, what is the potential for these animals to really be interacting with this potential threat? Um, as well as, you know, how are they interacting with these marine protected areas that are in the same area? Um, and so the way that we did this was to acoustically tag uh, giant sea bass. So, so we would catch them and we would tag them with an acoustic transmitter. And this transmitter pings a characteristic sound. Um, and as that animal moves around with that tag, making this pinging sound, we put out a bunch of different uh, receivers in the environment. And so as that animal moves around, if it goes next to a receiver, that receiver will hear that ping and say, this animal was at this location at this time. And in this way, we can actually track their movements through the space. Um, so we did this for multiple years. <laughs> and um, what we ended up finding was that the fish that we tagged were seemed to be resident to La Jolla. So um, all the fish that kind of stuck around post tagging uh, stayed in the La Jolla array for multiple months at a time. The fish that we ta that we tracked for the longest period was there for four years, almost consecutively. Um, and so that's a that's a strong indication that La Jolla could be an important area for this species because these animals were happy to spend lots and lots and lots of time there. Um, we also found 
that uh, they tended to spend a considerable amount of time outside of the marine protected areas. So they did spend a lot of time in this area where there's a lot of recreational fishing activity. Um, and that's potentially problematic, but like along with that, the, the, the amount of space that these animals use was relatively small. And so um, a huge caveat to this is that we fished and caught these animals outside of marine protected areas and released them outside of marine protected areas. So it's possible that there are animals living inside of the marine protected areas that are having these small home ranges that are getting protection from those MPAs. One of the other things that we found was that we suspect that there might be a spawning aggregation site um, kind of in these highly trafficked recreational fishing areas, um, which is potentially problematic. We don't really have an understanding of the level of threat of incidental catch to this species. And so that's definitely an avenue for future research. So I hope that people kind of see the value in doing kind of this just fundamental ecological research because it gives us valuable kind of baseline information to be able to ask questions that might be more applied. And kind of along that vein, um, I hope people take away that there's still so much to be learned about these fish. Um, and I hope this encourages people to ask more questions and go out and learn more about giant sea bass because they really are an amazing animal. Um, and I hope that people get to experience how cool they are for generations to come.